Okay, Year 12s, we're about to start from page 67. I think we're going to go through to about 87 today. Um, and here we are beginning with Rook, who's <clears throat> up at the top of the hillside. He's described in the past like a French pastry. That's how he describes it to his sister. Um, and he's looking down over the Sirius um, and he's reflecting on the clock or the timekeeper on board. And here we notice that um, he, the clock uh, makes him think of his sister who's um, back home where the clock would also say 5.30. So while 3.30 in Australia, 5.30 over there in England. Um, and his sister, Anne, would be curled up at 5.30 in his eider down and his uh, doona in the attic. So he'll be in her bed. Sorry, she'll be in his bed, keeping it warm for him. Um, and the connection with the family is noticed there. Uh, family connection um, or particularly at the connection with Anne um, he's sick of the um, faces of the officers that he's all seen or he knows too well and voices that can only utter words he's heard a dozen times before there's a yearning for adventure that is exposed here but also um, I guess the implication that there is these indigenous people or the natives that exist that can utter words he's never heard before, something new, um, an adventure of sorts. There's large descriptions of the coastland and he, here at the top of 69, I noted that <clears throat> the sense of identity and how we are different amongst different people so Rook acknowledges the person he was amongst those people, so the people in the ship. Second Lieutenant Rook, good with numbers, although awkward with people, was someone he inhabited like a stiff suit of clothes. That stiff suit of clothes could be a quote that you learn. For example, we're, we're talking about the sense of identity that we have, the different identities we put on as we interact with different people. Um, some may fit well and others may fit like a stiff suit of clothes. So it's revealing that he doesn't actually truly feel himself as Lieutenant Rook, as Second Lieutenant Rook. Um, and, but where he stood there on the um, promontory, the solitude without matched the solitude within and he felt unburdened. Um, so this is really that theme of identity and belonging and this place where he belongs. Um, so he would have the the um the place um this place he's chosen um astronomy would be, be his reason or his screen for a self he didn't choose to share with any of the other souls marooned a mum with him um and then there's an interaction here that he has with these two natives as he's at the top um, and he greets them saying, good afternoon, good afternoon. Um, and um, they kind of ignore him. Um, they, um, one man kind of plays with his spear and then they walk past him as if he were invisible and he wanted to yell out at them like he's a little bit offended, but they walk in such a dignified way. Um, that it keeps him silent and he watches as they go fishing um, one of the men uh, with his spear is lying close to the water and he darts his spear and then holds up a shining fish um, and then he comments that if Silk were here or Gardner were here, they wouldn't have let themselves be ignored. Um, Silk would be down there making conversations, trying his hand with a spear, which is interesting because it is just 
um, or the third person limited narration. This is Rook's perspective of what he believes um, Silk and Gardner would be able to get up to. As the reader, we know that that's not necessarily the case. Um, and here, the 71, bottom of 71, Rook um, goes to Governor Gilbert and asks him, can I have that space on the headland to establish an observatory? And um, the governor says no, and Rook is taken aback. Um, he actually has to now fight for what he um, what he wants. Um, and... So, at top of 72, um, the reason that governor the governor says you can't have this space is there's like a thousand people I'm looking forward, I'm looking after, sorry, a thousand souls that I'm responsible for and we only have a few tents. Um, and here Rook starts arguing, but... but this is why I'm here. The Astronomer Royal has provided the instruments. I need a space. Um, and he says, well, it's okay, but why so far away? We want everyone to come to be together, remain compact for security. Um, and I love this phrase here. Desperation gave his mind wings and his mouth words. It's a beautiful metaphoric description. Um, he, you know, he got some ideas about what to say next to keep arguing or keep persuading. He uses flattery, um, with the greatest respect, sir. He, 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 um, he doesn't actually need to be so far away. He doesn't actually need perfect darkness, but he presents that as his case because he desperately wants to be away from everybody so that he can kind of reinvent himself. Um, and there's a description here about how the fact that words are difficult language and how it pieces together is something he loves. But um, like words as in the poetry and the artistry of language doesn't come easily. Conversation doesn't come easily. And Rook says he sometimes thought he arrived at a sentence the way other people did multiplication the hard way by adding and then he keeps persuading um, Governor Gilbert of his case and Governor Gilbert is kind of tossing it up. Do I agree? Do I not? Um, and sort of calculates, do I keep him happy and maybe he'll do me a flavor later on? Or And finally, Governor Gilbert says, okay, you can have your headland, um, but... At the first sign of trouble, you'll be recalled. You're not so permanently there that you can have whatever you wish. I still own you. Um, and make sure your weapon is loaded at all times. That reminder that they're still in a war zone. Um, and there's a sense of destiny. But if there's a destiny waiting for him here, the governor was not interested in it. His position is quite fragile. And so the next section has a beautiful description of the building of his observatory. So 76 and 77 um, describe it. So it's a teepee like it sticks in the middle and um, canvas. So like a tent. Um, but in the middle it's got a hole and there's a... Um, a telescope sticking up in the middle and um, there's a whole bunch of prisoners that are helping to build this TP or this dome. Um, it's a description of the simple living quarters with a folding table, two chairs. They've got a shelf with his razor, a pen, a few books and he's got a bed, a stretcher for a bed with a blanket on it and then he of course he has his musket the powder and the shot um, that's page 77 and on to page 20 uh, 78 um, I thought this was of note this section here if you're annotating um, so it was simple but 
Nowhere on the world's surface had ever meant as much to him. It was his own, as no place ever had been other than the attic in Church Street. It was private. If he wanted to converse with himself, he could. He'd forgotten the pleasure of thinking aloud or talking to himself. There was no one here to judge, no one to remind him that being ordinary was hard work. So he had to put a lot of effort into being ordinary, but on his own, he could just be himself. Um, He felt like he had been compressed like a limb squeezed with a tourniquet for all those years of school and shipboard life. Now he could expand to fill whatever space was proper. So now he can finally expand. Could be a one word quote or expand to fill whatever space. Could be a few words. And here, himself, it was as unexplored a land as this one. Therefore, the unexplored land of Australia represents the unexplored self. And later on, there's something called a tabu, t- uh, tabula rasa, which is a blank tablet. Um, and Brook is like that. So unexplored land represents unexplored self. So the symbolism of the physical environment, something to really note there on page 78, if you haven't already done so. Um, And then there's discussions about the comet and the astronomy work. Um, I'm going to turn over to page 80. Um, Some discussions of the... um, his physical space um, and page 81 there's a discussion of the waters of the port that was never still always in conversation with itself and with the shore I think that this can also be represented water the descriptions of water versus the descriptions of land are quite poetic and metaphorical there Um, so there's personification used So the water is in conversation with itself, uh, but it also could represent the relative chaos of change. Um, So it's something you could certainly use. Um, And page 82. Um, Here, there's a description of Rook um, going to dinner onto um, the ship um, or the barracks. So he goes... Um, to eat with all of the other officers on Sunday night Um, and he sees the governor and Major Wyatt there Um, and he sits himself next to Silk and Lieutenant Timpson. Um, Lieutenant Timpson is tedious, a bit moralistic. Um, He's against all those damn whores, so um, all the women prisoners and he likes showing people his little miniature of um, his sweetheart, so a painting of his sweetheart. Um, And Silk and Rook think that he, by the end of the season, be tempted to visit the other ladies at Mrs. Butcher's. Um, There's a suggestion through the description of the food they're given. They're given plates of food and Silk calls it a diabolical morsel, daily diabolical morsel. Notice the alliteration there, but also the emotive language. Morsel has the connotation of something that is small, a bite-sized piece, which suggests that they are actually starving later on that's hint uh, not just hinted at that's explicitly stated but you could use that um, the description of the food as a daily diabolical morsel um, with its connotation of being something small and bite-sized um, suggests the lack of food that is in the colony um, page 84 um, silk makes this joke and everybody kind of has a laugh he gets away with the joke despite the governor's um, presence um it talks about the fact that there's no food that is actually growing gardens have been planted but no turnip or potato had grown bigger than a marble um 
that they can occasionally or now and then they um, the shooter goes out and brings something that's tasty like meat but it's unrecognizable and it's tough um, and they use all of it I imagine it's probably kangaroo or possum or something um, as actually kangaroo or possum but supplies were running short um, and they were meant to send for supply ships but they are nowhere to be seen there was not enough food um, and so they're all a little bit worried and tense about the fact that there's not enough food um, bottom of 85 we'll see that they have these plates there is not a single man who believed that the newest settlement would last it's only a matter of time of whether they starved first 85 now the symbol of this by the way back here on top of 84 elderly salt beef and peas porridge okay peas porridge is actually like chickpea um, and salt beef I'm assuming is something like um, oh, what's it called beef jerky perhaps it'll last for a long time but elderly beef jerky which means it's old not particularly good quality food so these salt beef and peas porridge are representative of the starvation. Um, now let's turn to 86 and 87, the end of this section. Um, and um, the governor declares his intention of actually going exploring. So taking um, a party of men to the hinterland so a little bit further away uh, to see if they can turn the land to account that means make it useful because nothing will grow at Sydney Cove um, and they're trying to find some natives that are more prepared to parley which is pirate language that kind of means make peace um, than those we've encountered here which they've kind of stuffed up by shooting the shield and perhaps not being so welcoming but anyway um, and he asks for volunteers, whether anybody would like to volunteer them. Rook is the first to stand on his feet and says, Lieutenant Rook, sir, I will go. Um, he's dreaming about all there is to explore and see birds, mammals and their habitations. Silk is the second who says, Captain Silk, also, sir, at your service. Um, and... Then after they volunteered, Silk and Rook have a conversation where Silk says, wow, I thought I was the quickest jack-in-the-box in the regiment. This could be a quote, a great quote for Silk, by the way. Um, the quickest jack-in-the-box in the regiment, um, which just means he's very quick to react um, and volunteer. Um, so all of these bad things, prickles, sunburns, mosquitoes are all coming but the worse it is the better it will read on the page so it will make a great story silk is just motivated by his need for a great story he wants to go because he wants adventure for his story and that is the end of that section